Hello, historical geology students. Uh, this is the last video for today's lecture, which is for Ju July the 6th, Monday. Uh, July the 6th, 13th, don't forget, is the next test. Um, we already talked about some geologic structures. We've talked about folds and faults so far, right? Uh, for faults, you need to be able to recognize reverse fault, thrust fault, normal fault, right lateral strike, slip fault, left lateral strike, slip fault. And then uh, we talked about an anticlines where the rocks are folded like this. And then synclines. And we talked about an axial plane which divides the folds in half. And we also talked about plunging anticlines and plunging synclines. Right? So that the axial planes are not vertical for a plunging fold. Let's take a look here real quick. Plunging anticline. So um, for this um, upcoming uh, lab, you're going to need to identify plunging anticlines and non-plunging anticlines. So this is what a plunging anticline looks like, for example, right here, or the axial plane is not vertical, and You need to be able to recognize these by looking at a geologic map. Let me get this up here for you. Maybe I hate this stupid thing. Let's see. Okay. Anyway, you can see it here. See these strike and dip symbols? The rocks are dipping away from the center of this plunging anticline, which is a bunch of U's like this instead of the stripes we saw with the non-plunging anticline. So we're going to look at, a, uh, in the lab, you have to identify a plunging anticline versus a regular anticline, which would be stripes of rock. And then a plunging syncline versus a non-plunging syncline. The anticlines, the rocks get older as you go towards the center. Synclines, the rocks get younger as you walk towards the center of the fold. Anticline, the rocks dip away from the center of the anticline. This is a plunging syncline right here, you can see, because the beds are dipping towards the center of this syncline. And here's the side view. So what you need to be able to do is look just, imagine that all of this down here on the block diagram was white, blank. All you got was this information here. You need to be able to fill out this, these blocks like this. We're going to be working with block diagrams. Next structures <clears throat> that we need to look at are uh, domes and basins. What is a dome and a basin? Well, okay, with an anticline, you might imagine that the rocks look like this, right? With a syncline, they're like this. Plunging syncline would be like this. Where it's tilt it's tilted the axial plane is tilted okay anyway a dome on the other hand is just imagine a bowl like a cereal bowl here's a bowl the rocks are arranged in a bowl like shape that's a dome and a basin would be like this so in 3d what will it look like? Well, let's take a look here. Here's a... Okay, I'm going to draw you a picture here. I can do... I probably can draw a better picture than you get on Google. A dome is going to look like this in a geologic map. Remember, here's your geologic map. It's, and imagine that I could draw a square here, but I can't do that with this writing tool. But there's your geologic map in front of you piece of paper, geologic map. If you see something like this, remember one is the oldest rock, two is the youngest rock, 
I, I, two is younger than one, and three is the youngest rock here. So the, as you walk towards the center of this bullseye, the rocks become older. If you see a bullseye pattern where the rocks get older as you walk towards the center, that's a dome. This is called a dome. So, I, um, with a dome, think about it. With a dome, the rocks are all dipping away from the top of the dome, right? So, let, I'm going to draw you some strike and dips here. And you should be able to do this yourself. Strike's always going to follow the bedding planes. That's these two blue lines here. So, and, the, and it's going to dip away from the center of the dome. This is the proper strike and dip symbols for a dome. So if you see a bullseye pattern like this, with the oldest rocks in the center, you know it's a dome and you can go ahead and draw in your strike and dip symbols. What's a base what does a basin look like then? Well, a basin is going to look like this. Again, you got your geologic map, and you got your youngest rock in the center. And you got younger rocks as you go away from the center of the basin. Now, draw on your strike and dips now. Can you do it? Well, think about it. With a bowl, you got a whole bunch of rocks, bed four, bed three, bed two, bed one. But four would be in the center, which is the youngest rock. So which way are the beds dipping? Are they dipping towards the center of the bowl? Yes. If I poured milk into this bowl, it would go into the center. So that what would be the proper strike and dips for this? Again, try and follow the uh, the strikes are going to follow the bedding planes and the dips which are shorter always drawn shorter than the strikes are going to go towards the center of the basin like that okay that's what a basin looks like sorry let's see here why I'm doing that. Okay, so if, if, if the oldest rocks are in the center, one is older than, than two, and two is older than three, what is this? That's a, not a bullseye. So it's not a dome. This is an anticline, right? This is an anticline. And is it plunging or non plunging? It's not plunging because it's stripes. And we could draw in our strike and dips because beds always dip away from the center of an anticline. I could make this into a, di a block diagram. And then I would know that this is an anticline, so I just draw on an anticline. Then you put the, the age symbols here. So, be able to remember if you got a bullseye pattern, it's a, it's either a dome or a basin. If it's a dome, the rocks are dipping away from the center, and if it's a basin, the rocks are dipping towards the center.
Here's a picture from your book. It shows you all the different kinds of faults. Here, hanging wall is going down. This is a normal fault. Here, the hanging wall is going up. It's a reverse fault. Normal faults form from tensional stress at divergent plate boundaries. Reverse faults form at convergent plate boundaries, hang, causing the hanging wall to go up. Thrust fault. Left, uh, the strike slip fault. This is, is this a right lateral or a left lateral? It's a left lateral. Strike slip fault. It's a left lateral strike slip fault. Oh, one other thing you want to remember is, um, remember geology is about making money, right? We talked about that before. Any climbs are the best places to find oil and some natural gas. So if you have property and you have a real you have an anticline, you can recognize it by looking at the geologic map and you can make money out of it. You can have an oil drilling company come on your property and uh, they'll pay for the equipment. You have to sign a contract. Um, you get a share of the profit. You have to deal with having an oil rig on your property, which is not an attractive thing. It can be noisy if it if the equipment's um, not running right. But you'll get a monthly check. With the domes are really important also because they're the best um, geologic structure for natural gas. Natural gas in the United States is. Um, we have more natural gas in the United States than any other country in the world. And um, there are pros and cons about natural gas. Uh, I'm not going to get political about it because that's not my job. I'm a scientist. I'll, I'm going to look at it cold, uh, the cold hard facts. And there are advantages and disadvantages of using natural gas. Let's first talk about the anti-natural gas people. They'll, they'll say, what are the, some problems we have with natural gas? Well, um, when you use natural gas, you release carbon dioxide because it's a fossil fuel. When you burn fossil fuels, you add CO2 into the atmosphere, and it leads to some global warming. Now, you don't release as much CO2 as oil, but you do uh, when you burn gasoline but natural gas does release some. So it will result in some climate change. And we are worried about climate change because the earth is warming up and it's warming up too fast and it's causing all kinds of problems such as um, the growth of deserts, um, which is causing some people to starve to death. Uh, tropical diseases are moving into areas where they never existed before. Um, so there are problems with burning that. Uh, and also, another problem is in order to get natural gas, we have to use fracking. And fracking, we inject these chemicals into the ground with water and to make cracks in the ground, to make the, the domes, the natural gas go through to the well more easily for these domes. And if fracking is not done properly, uh, some of these chemicals can get into the water supply and contaminate them. Also, if there are faults nearby, it could set off little earthquakes or big earthquakes. Because when a fault is lubricated, then the rocks are going to slide more easily, and so earthquakes could occur. Well, to be fair, let's talk about the pro natural gas people. Natural gas is a cheap source of energy. So it keeps the energy bills for people lower than they otherwise would be. So it's a big help to people, especially in northern climates, where they have a cheap source of energy. It's domestic, so we don't have to import this energy, which is a good thing because um, we have a huge nation, national deficit. 
we, we want to use energy that's from the United States and not send our money overseas. Three, if it creates a large amount of jobs, high paying jobs. If you go to um, North Dakota, there's almost no unemployment there. And the, the uh, people can go work there and support their whole family. And that's a good thing because we need high paying jobs for young people. Another advantage of using natural gas is we've developed the technology where we, where we can liquefy it and so we can send it to other countries by ship. And that means we're bringing, we're reducing our, 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 na our national deficit. We're sending products overseas and um, we're making hundreds of billions of dollars doing that. So there's the advantages and disadvantages there. When you see a picture like this, the first thing that should come in your mind is this: these are a bunch of faults. For example, you can see one fault right here. See this arcos here and this arcos here? This side moved up, this side moved down. Put your, your base of your fist on this fault plane, on this fault surface, and that tells you that this and your thumb will point to the revert to the hanging wall right here. So the hanging wall has moved down relative to the foot wall. And so you, when you see a picture like this, you should think to yourself, this is a normal fault. And it formed probably at a divergent plate boundary by pulling apart the rocks from tensional stress. You should be able to glean all of that by looking at that photograph. Look at all of these normal faults. You have one, two, three, four normal faults here. In each case, the hanging wall has moved down, the foot wall has moved up. This must have formed at a divergent plate boundary by pulling the rock apart. That's tensional stress. When you have a whole bunch of normal faults, you will force, form these things called horsts and grobbins. The horse is the part that's moved up, and the graben is the block that has dropped down. So grobbins end up becoming valleys, and horse be end up becoming mountains. This is what a mid-ocean ridge looks like, where you pull apart the rocks, you get these horsts, which are, is, is the top of the mid-ocean ridge. Then you have these valleys, which are called grobbins. Here's a reverse fault, and you need to be able to recognize what a reverse fault looks like. You should know this is a hanging wall, and the hanging wall has moved up. Therefore, this must be a reverse fault. Here's a thrust fault. You can see the hanging wall. And you can see the foot wall. The hang wall is moved up just like with the reverse fault. Only this angle here is not as steep. So that's why we call this a thrust fault. I'm going to ask you to do uh, um, to identify all these features we've been talking about. Anticlines, synclines, Plunging anticlines, plunging synclines, reverse faults, normal faults, thrust faults, um, domes, basins in the next lab. And we'll, so we'll talk about that. Uh, you're going to need to tear pages out of your lab manual to do that and deliver it to my house because there's no other way to do it. But we'll talk about that later. Okay. So we talked about how earthquakes occur. Earthquakes occur when faults move and they occur to elastic deformation which is elastic rebound. It means the rocks change shape until they can no longer change shape and then they release their energy as an earthquake. Here's a fault and when the fault moves 
you get an earthquake. Now, these are two terms that we need to get comfortable with. The first is a focus, and then the other is epicenter. You, you've heard in the news when the news reporter, he or she talks about uh, the epicenter of the earthquake was located 10 miles northeast of Los Angeles or whatever. What does that mean, the epicenter of the earthquake? Well, when the fault moves, imagine my two hands. Here's, here's um, and in between my two hands is the fault. And the rocks on top, they move the, f the place where the movement first occurs along my hands or along the fault plane. That's the focus. That's where the earthquake begins. The earthquake begins at the focus, which is a point on the fault plane of the fault, which is this plane here. The location directly above the focus is called the epicenter. So the epicenter is located directly above the focus. Usually, the most damage to buildings occurs when you're at the epicenter. And as you go away from the epicenter, you have less damage to buildings. And that's real important to remember because, as Californians say, it's not earthquakes that kill people, it's buildings that kill people. When buildings collapse, that's when most people get killed. So, remember when you were a little kid, uh, maybe your dad took you to um, a lake or something, and you threw a pebble into the pond, and all of those ripples emanated outward like circles from the location where the pebble first struck the water? Well, that's exactly how earthquake waves, they, they come from the focus and they emanate out. They go out in all directions from the focus of the earthquake. And you... These are wa waves of energy are called seismic waves. Seismic waves. Seismology. So that here's a whole bunch of words we need to memorize. Seismology is the study of earthquakes. A subfield of geology is called seism seismology, and some geologists specialize in studying earthquakes. They are seismologists. So if you specialize in studying earthquakes, you are a seismologist. A seismograph is a, is a machine, it's a device that records seismic waves, earthquake waves, coming from the focus of the earthquake. And so a seismograph is going to record when uh, earthquake waves uh, it's going when they arrive at the seismograph it then those seismic waves will be recorded a seismogram is the actual data record of the earthquake a seismic center is the central location for all of these scientific devices called seismographs and a seismic state center such as the Los Angeles Seismic Center you will have dozens of seismologists working there they're gonna have offices there they'll have hundreds of seismographs uh, and the seismographs will produce data records called seismograms let me show you what a seismogram looks like. Here's a seismogram. And you can see usually nothing happens. So usually um, you don't have earthquakes, uh, you know, so you get nothing all day long. That's your seismogram for 24 hours. Maybe um, from uh, 12 noon on J June the 14th, for example, to 12 noon on June the 15th, a 24-hour period. Usually, you're going to get nothing. 
because you're not going to have an earthquake most of the time. But when you get an earthquake, this is what your seismogram is going to look like. First you get a bunch of waves hit you, seismic waves, then you get another bunch, and then you get another bunch. We'll take a look at what these waves are. There are four kinds of waves. Uh, and they're called P waves, S waves, R waves, and L waves. P is in Paul, S is in Sam, R is in Ronald, L is in Linda. So here's your seismogram being recorded. Uh, there's a roll of paper on here or a photographic sheet and it rolls at, at a constant rate and the pen will record any movement in the earth from earthquakes. At a particular seismic station uh, you will have you could have dozens of these seismographs and um, it's sort of like uh, you could work from home and and get this data sent to you from the seismographs data sent to you on your phone or your iPad or your computer. So you would be getting these seismograms all day long. But when you get an earthquake, then you have to go to work. You have to go into the office. And all these seismologists will discuss um, um, which uh, they'll try and figure out how big was the earthquake, the Richter magnitude, where was the epicenter of the earthquake, and why do you need to do that? You need you need to do that so you can um, do search and rescue because there's going to be buildings that have fallen down, and um, the police and the first responders have to dig underneath the rubble to rescue people you're going to have uh, broken water mains uh, because the water pipes are going to burst and that's a problem because uh, the natural gas lines will also break so you're going to have fires spread throughout the area and the firefighters um, aren't going to have too much water pressure through their hoses unless they're they're ready for that and they have water storage tanks or cisterns that they can use so they can fight the fires. So all this has to be, um, there's a plan for what happens when you have an earthquake. What do the fi what does the fire department do? What does the police do? What, what do the paramedics do? And all of this is um, based on what the seismologists recommend. The head seismologist will use the recommendations from all of these seismograms and report to the governor of the state for example the governor of California the governor of California it then decides whether or not to call in the National Guard the National Guard can do all kinds of search and rescue they can uh, come in with sniffer dogs so they can smell who's under buried underneath concrete or buildings and try and rescue them they can um, people. They're going to be a lot of homeless people because their houses fell down, and they're going to have to set them up in temporary accommodations. They're going to have to bring in food and water for people uh, after the earthquake. They um, the, they can go even further, and if it's a if it's a really big earthquake, the governor can call the president of the United States and ask for emergency help, uh, including um, including um, money to help uh, accommodate all these people who have suffered from the earthquake, um, including um, authorization for um, federal officials from the FEMA to come in and distribute a medicine, food and water, the Red Cross can come in and then uh, there has to be protection from looters because people will take advantage of the situation and uh, so all of that has to be worked through through government agencies federal, state and city officials 
there's four main waves that come out of an earthquake. The first is called the P wave. So the P wave is the fastest wave. It comes out first from the focus of the earthquake. That's followed by the next wave, the S wave. And then you get an R and an L wave. So P, then S, then R, then L. Let's take a look here. P is the fastest wave, then S, then R, then L. So here's your P wave, and it's the fastest wave. And the P wave is um, a wave of vibrations. That's what this, is, this diagram is trying to show you, that goes through rocks. It, a, P, a P wave has never killed a single person. It, the, uh, if an earthquake occurs, if you've never experienced a big earthquake, the Californians experience this all the time, it, it just feels like a vibration underneath your feet. The P wave is going to save your life. Californians know that. As soon as you feel that vibration under your feet, take cover. Get under a desk. Run away from a building if you can. And if you can't, there's no desks around, go underneath a doorway. That's the strongest part of the, of the building if you cannot get under a desk. So what does a P wave feel like? Well, um... Have you ever been on a um, subway, like in New York City, or in Marta in um, Atlanta, or the Underground in London, the, we call it the Tube in London, or the U-Bahn in Berlin, or, or the Metro, the Metro in, in Paris, in Paris, and the train, and you're standing on the train platform and in the subway, and the train is coming, you feel that platform vibrate. It feels exactly like that. It's a vibration. That's the fastest wave and it will reach you first. Notice it does not change the shape of the rocks. It's just a vibration that goes through the rocks. So since the rocks are not deformed, no one gets killed by the P waves. Buildings are not affected. Then comes the S wave. So the S wave always comes after the P wave. The S wave causes the rocks to deform. Therefore, the S wave is the killer wave. The S wave kills most people uh, from during an earthquake. And and notice um, that it, okay, this is a way to imagine an S wave. Imagine that I bought an eye bolt. An eye bolt has a screw on it, and I screwed it into this wall here. And there's a little hole here. And then I took a rope and I tied it into this eye bolt. And then I pulled the rope tight. And then I went like this with the rope. That's exactly how rocks behave. There's waves up and down from the S wave. The S wave kills a lot of people. And then a lot of people think, that oh, after the S wave hits you, then the earthquake is over. No, it's not over. And that's why you don't, if a building has been damaged, you don't want to run back into that building and get your belongings. Because the building can still fall down from the R wave and the L wave. The next wave that hits you is the Raleigh wave. But before I go into Raleigh waves and love waves, I'll just mention P and S waves are body waves. Because they move through the body of the earth. They go inside the earth. Whereas... R and L waves are surface waves. If you're from New York, they're surface waves. And they only move on the surface of the Earth. Okay, having said that, the Raleigh wave, which is a surface wave, hits you next. And that feels kind of like um, there's a wave that hits you. And Okay, Matt, uh, have you ever been on a ship in the ocean, like a cruise ship? If you go on to Royal Caribbean or Carnival Cruises, 
and the wave goes under your ship, the ship goes up, and then the ship goes down into the trough of the wave, and it goes up. And so you're, it, the ship is going like this. That's why people get seasick. If you ever go, when you go off the ship, you're still going back, and your body's not used to being on land, and then you have to get accommodated to that. So that movement, that undulation, causes buildings to fall that um, that have already been weakened, sometimes. But the, then, if you th after the Urali wave hits you, the next wave hits you, the love wave, the L wave. And the L wave moves you back and forth and up and down. Not as much as the S wave, but it moves you back and forth, up and down. The love wave moves you back and forth and up and down. The love wave hits you, and then what do you do? You say, honey, pass me that towel. I'm sorry. That's so wrong. All right, I'm done for now. I'll talk to you more later.